will be facilitating the conversation today. Um, today with me, I have wonderful, four wonderful uh, speakers um, come from very different backgrounds. We're going to share about um, their experience and their insights on, um, on the topic. So um, before we begin, I would like to um, just do a very quick um, introduction to all the panelists. Yeah. Um, so on the uh, left hand side right here, I have Dr. Lim Tikmang. He is the president of the Singapore Association for the Advanced, uh, Advancement of Science, the president of the Singapore National Academy of Science, the member of the Singapore Bioethics Advisory Com Committee, a former board member of the Association of Science and Technology Centers, and the president of the Asian Pacific Science Centers Network. Welcome, Dr. Jitmeng. This is not the first time you are here. You are a regular speaker at uh, Asia, and you supported in the past uh, as well with the Science Center. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Welcome. And next, I have uh, Sinhu uh, Changar from, uh, from Microsoft. She is uh, heading the Azure business for um, SAP, digital and app innovation in Azure hybrid for Microsoft's Asia Pacific region. She's been already eight years um, with Microsoft. She is responsible for defining the GTM strategy to deliver customer and partner success and for revenue growth of the businesses. Sinhu, once again, welcome to the Post Asia Summit. For years, for years. Yeah, but if you're in long days, for years. Yes, and uh, next I have here um, Kiwi Tang. Um, he's um, not only a friend of mine, but also um, one of um, the um, uh, previous organizer of the Force Asia Summit. So Kiwi, at the moment, um, leading, he is the CEO of a local a hardware production company called Lions Forge. This company actually produces a laser cutter. Yeah, so if you're not aware that people talk about Singapore, we are very famous for uh, shopping more, a lot of services industry, but we actually produce something here locally. And we will talk more about it later. Uh, previous to, um, to his company, he actually a fighter um, air crew for the Singapore Air Force for many years. Um, yes, and as mentioned already, um, Kiwi used to um, be in the organization of the Force Asia Summit previously. Welcome, Kiwi. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, last but not least, um, very excited to meet uh, Cheryl uh, Tukup. This is your first time here at the summit, Cheryl? First time at the summit, yeah. Yes, so Cheryl is the um, Regional Director, Marketing for Asia Pacific at Rafana Labs. Um, she recently established a marketing team for Rafana, uh, originally from the Philippines, uh, but Cheryl been here for over 16 years now and over uh, 20 years of experience in the IT industry. Mm -hmm. Very happy to have you here. Thank you for, for joining us. Thank you for having me. Okay, so um, let's um, go in on to our first question. So I have a few questions prepared for the panelists before uh, we open up to, um, to the audience. So my, uh, my first question is actually, I only did a very brief introduction. I want to understand um, and would like you to share with the audience what inspired you to pursue a career in science and technology and how did you get started? So, how about... Uh, um, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll start. Yes, yeah, sure. Would you like to start? Last, I might as well start, you know? <laughs> Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I hope everyone's having a good time. Yeah? Yeah. That's a woo! <laughs> Sorry, I'm in marketing. I need to do it. 
Um, so uh, I started in tech really, uh, really oddly. I'm actually, uh, I think one of the things that I put in my bio is that I actually graduated with a finance degree, major in banking. So I should be in a bank right now, right? But I graduated in 2000, and anyone here who was who graduated in 2000, don't be shy. It's okay. <laughs> um, that was a dot com boom, right? So everyone's talking about dot, the, the tech, the, the dot com, and whatever. I'm thinking, I want to be there, right? So instead of going to a bank, sitting there and talking to your clients and getting them to open an account, I decided to go to tech, right? That's basically it. Yeah, and then never look back. Yeah. Well, uh, since you passed the mic to me, I was hoping that you'll go that way. Um, you, you talk about graduating in the year 2000. Yeah. Who were born in 1960? <laughs> 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 okay. Right. Uh, Hong Fu, you know that I'm not a so-called IT person. Okay. Uh, I, I'm a biologist. Uh, I'm a biologist, and I, I always loved science and nature since I was a little kid. Uh, I can claim the status of uh, being the first on CSTC using computer simulation. At the time, uh, I, I, I'm always very curious, so I'm a learner. By nature, I'm a learner. I'm still learning, and that's the reason why I come here to, to learn whenever I, I can. Uh, I remember when I was doing my on CSTC, I was introduced to programming language called BASIC. I mean, it's way ancient to, to many of you. And it was so basic that it's no more in existence now. But I learned how to do programming, and, uh, and, and I think that was the first thesis ever in, 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 the, in the NUS, the department. Without touching any single animal, I did a project simulating sampling of animals in the field. And uh, using that to calculate uh, so-called impact. That means meaning you can compare this community and this community, what was what the difference? And at a time when I presented it, the professors, they all didn't understand what I was talking about. I heard the professor say, ah, oh, let's give him the benefit of doubt and give him a, a good grade. Uh, but my, my professor was telling me, let's try and see whether the, whether the field out there believe in what we came up with. And uh, I was very happy that the paper was accepted in a journal. And now that I'm in NUS, and they all talk about ranking of the journal, at that time, it was considered top-class journal. So, so that was my first foray into using IT, and that's the reason why I, I, I believe in tech. And when you came to Science Center to ask whether we could support you for Force Asia, uh, I saw that it is a very meaningful proposition, and I'm very happy that you have grown to this stage now. Every year you are back, every year it becomes stronger and bigger. So thank you very much. So that's my, my journey. It's out of curiosity that I, I continue to stay in the science and tech environment. Out of curiosity, yeah. And then, uh, Sinhu, before we go to the next question, would you, would you like to go next? Okay, sure. Um, so when I uh, was thinking about my options, 20, uh, in, in 2000 is when I graduated as well. <laughs> uh, tech is where the money and the opportunities were. And so many years later, that's still where the money is. Right. So fast forward all this time, uh, I've, I've still been in tech. I started off my first job in Dell because my, my, my degree, my undergrad was in computer hardware. Uh, I didn't want to do what everybody else was doing, which was software. So I said, OK, I'm going to do something different. And I went the hardware route. Um, but nevertheless, I did a part-time software course, and then eventually, so I started my first job with Dell in hardware. Once I, uh, and then I did move on to do my MBA a year later, because um, I always thought I wanted to get into the business side of things. Uh, and guess what? Even after my MBA, on day zero, when all of the companies were coming to campus for hiring, the tech companies were once taking the slots. Right, the, Z, the day zero slots, not the consulting companies, not the finance companies, but it was the tech companies taking the, the day zero slots. And that's how I landed my, my second job in another tech company, but this time in services. So I landed up in the IT services industry, um, one of the, the, the global in, you know, players in that space. Um, and so I've never looked back again. I've been moving continents, I've moved countries, but eventually, I've, I've continued staying in the tech industry. 
that's where it is. Yeah, so you and Kiwi have something in common. Also, he was so into hardware. How about you, Kiwi? Uh, okay, so, so I think the story go back to about 2015. Uh, then I was still a major uh, in the flying F-16 uh, in the Air Force. Uh, so what happened here then at 2015 is that the government is promoting innovation and um, entrepreneurship. Uh, I think that's where the Smart Nation uh, initiative was rolled out. Uh, so at the back of my mind, I totally believe uh, in this movement, at least for Singapore, coming from a very kind of like patriotic kind of thing. Uh, but one thing that I've seen is that the manufacturing ecosystem in Singapore already more or less is reaching its uh, uh, tail end of the decline. I decided that as a, uh, so I imagine that how can an average Singaporean come out using open source or whatever resource they have back then to really enterprise and create a product that's made in Singapore. Um, so that took me uh, on a journey uh, from 2015 to 2017. Uh, where I do a lot of open source projects. In fact, that's the only resource that I can find. And that is how actually I met Hong Fu uh, in one of the science, science hack data. Uh, that's how I kind of joined uh, Force Asia. Uh, then in 2017, uh, um, as I kind of mentoring Singapore students, is that like, okay, you need to uh, innovate, you need to enterprise, but now you're having a secure job and now you're telling people to take risks. It doesn't make sense. So I need to lead by example. So I quit my job, decided to start a company called Lions Forge. Uh, and then using same thing, I have no engineering background, but just using pure whatever I can learn from the community, and then develop a product that can compete on the global stage. And then with that lesson, I will just pass down uh, to all the young folks here, uh, whoever, whoever willing to listen to me. Yeah, and you took part in a lot of makers fair. And that's how we got to know one another. Yes, yes, and then yes, yes. again. Uh, <laughs> Very happy to see you going from strength to strength. I, I walked downstairs and saw your booth downstairs. Uh, indeed, Lion Forge doing very well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, feel free to come down, see the booth, and then see uh, what we can do with open source. <laughs> right? Yeah, so I find it really uh, like, inspiring to hear the story. Like for some of us, didn't it not start in the tech uh, major, but we all ended up here in tech. And can we mention something that I want to... Uh, Actually, the main question that I have here today, um, which is related to open source, how important is having experience in open source projects for getting higher in the tech industry? We are at the open source conference, and what is your opinion on this? Kiwi, do you want to, to talk? You mentioned already that you want to show the potential of open source to younger students uh, in Singapore. Uh, the context is uh, slightly a bit different uh, because here you're talking about how to get a job, right? So mm -hmm. for me, it's more on how to be an entrepreneur. Uh, even if you do not have any kind of background, uh, the, it's just that the wealth of knowledge and resources in the open source uh, uh, community or the world, or I would say the, the, the open source universe, it, is, it has grown really like strength to strength. It is amazing. I, I couldn't imagine, like, let's say back in the 1990s, uh, let's say when I started in poly, if I were to do the exact same thing that I want to do, it's impossible. Not without open source. So, the, um, uh, so it, it, in the way, just now, as if you guys have listened to the few of the lectures, right, it's like, you can see that the, 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 the technology refresh rate uh, and enhance rate is so fast and so rapid. Trust me, no education system can support that. So you need to, you want to keep yourself up to speed, you need to be part of the open source community to keep up. I, I like to add on to that, what Kiwi said is uh, open source by, by its definition is open, open for access, is, is democratizing the, the, the tools, so to speak. And in the science center field, we also look into open source. And I also encourage our people here, to, especially young ones, to get into that. Uh, because through open source, you get into the opportunity to co-create many things. And in the Science Center, there are many things that can be co-created because of open source. And in the format of including even making very immersive kind of uh, uh, omni-data system. Because now, uh, with a lot of data coming in, you can actually pull out data from NASA, you can pull out data from Google Earth, and using open source, you can stitch together and narrate a program. Mm -hmm. And you can actually share with the community who can create those. Uh, recently, we just created one that is bringing you from Earth all the way up to the edge of the universe and come back to Earth again. And that is because the open source platform. Yeah. Um, I can probably attest to that as well. Um, 
the open source is about creating an open mindset. So it's all about collaborating and making sure that you're sharing so that others can benefit. You build on the value creation and let others use it. So today, if you think about, like even a statistic, about 90% of enterprises are using open source in some way or another. So there's no running away from open source. And even large enterprises like Microsoft use as well as contribute a lot to GitHub. Uh, they contribute reuse code from GitHub. So it's a lot of open source that's being used across. So yes, to hiring, I would think yes, but definitely will, will be a useful skill to have. Yeah, and to me it's more really, it's in the, uh, everything that was said is really often to, put, to reiterate that fact that it's a lifestyle now. You know, um, kids, they Google something, they only go for the free ones. It's technically open source, you know? Um, it's inevitable. And uh, most big tech companies that are legacy, technically legacy, like, okay, I'll mention the one that I came from, F5, right? Are investing in open source, acquiring companies like Nginx, mm -hmm. um, IBM, Red Hat, right? Um, it, it is a lifestyle, it is the way to go. Um, so if you want to advance, uh, you will inevitably get to an open source um, journey anyway um, to be able to actually advance your career. You know, I think it's it's just the way it is. Yes. So, Cheryl, um, since you have the mic, I want to continue with you. So you mentioned that uh, you were in finance and then later on moved into tech, right? So we regularly receive questions from, from people in the community how I can get into tech if I did not uh, have a major in computer science or technology. And the next question that I have for you and also perhaps in who, um, you mentioned that when you get into tech because of the money, right? So people here, we have very young audience also from online. They all want to get a job like with corporation, uh, well-known companies, right? And it's also even more important in Asia. You know that we all need to do find a job to support our family and, and a lot of like challenges these days in, in the society. So the question is, what are the most important qualities employers look for candidates in applying for a tech position? So especially, for instance, you can give us an example from Grafana or Microsoft. Sure. What kind of qualities? Uh, well, so I'm in marketing. So I just hired, I recently just hired someone um, in India. Uh, my first uh, uh, marketing manager there. I have one in Australia too. Um, and for Grafana, because we are a startup in APAC. We only started a month, uh, a year and a half ago, right? So I don't have the luxury of the big tech that, oh, get an agency, do, the, do everything. No, we have to, I'm a director, but I also do, I also take the pull-up banners. Mario saw me yesterday. I was the one pulling up the banners. I was carrying luggages, right? And yeah, and, and to me, what I look for, for a person is um, resilience. You know, a person has to be able to do the strategy part, also the tactical part, and the hands-on part. That is at least from a startup perspective, because I, that's my forte, at least from my perspective, right? So yeah, I think that's, that's really what's uh, important. Um, and that, that, that relates back not only for tech, but for, I think, the current career opportunities anywhere in the world right now, yeah. So what you say, people need to say yes, start doing things. Yeah, you, like you have to be able, you, you have to be willing to learn new things and to be able to do, actually do it. Like, you do not just talk the talk, but also do the talk. Right, yeah. Yeah, totally. Sinho, how about Microsoft? So I will give you, I'll sum it up in, in three C's, okay? So I'll give you three C's that you can easily remember. Um, so one, and, and these are again, like Cheryl said, these are uh, skills or things that you would take across industries. So irrespective of whether it's tech, but tech can be applicable across industries as well. So it's relevant to all of these. So one is, is strong communication skills. Uh, that's something that any employer would look for. Make sure that you're able to communicate your ideas, you're able to influence for impact. You need to make sure that you're getting the message across, whether you're in the form of writing, whether in the form of speaking, you have to get your ideas across. Uh, the second is collaboration. You have to collaborate. So there's a no one-man island none of us can exist alone. So if everything is a very, is, is a lot of teamwork. 
So you end up, whether it's, it's creating code or building an application um, or whether it's marketing, we end up doing a lot of teamwork. So collaborate is, is your second one. Uh, the third would be curiosity, which means be a lifelong learner right? uh, and continue to keep learning. Uh, I think there's no limit to uh, us learning and, and no matter what job it is or what, and, and sometimes you get disrupted. Now think about how COVID disrupted everybody, a lot of industries. And there were people who went right from, uh, from being in the travel industry to learning DevOps and moving to a DevOps industry or a role. So you have to be open to learning and being a lifelong learner. So no better place to start because we're at the lifelong <laughs> learning center. <laughs> So those are the three C's. Thanks. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, so talking about lifelong uh, learning, Dr. Tim Wang, so you have a lot of experience in education, and can you also, um, uh, can we mentioned earlier, so whatever we, we learn in school, university, might not be relevant anymore by the time we graduate. So um, what do you think? Um, what should people do like to keep up with the rapid changes in technology to stay relevant for the job markets? I think uh, you have to recognize that the world is changing so fast that you cannot stop learning. So first thing first, get it right. Get into your genes, get your DNA, whatever you call it. Lifelong learning. I think this is something that you cannot not afford to invest your time in. And of course, be curious. I think if you're curious, you're interested, you can find things out. And uh, coming to a platform like the Force Asia, it's a good platform uh, because there are a lot of new ideas uh, just now just sitting in listening to the previous speaker then uh, when you talk about how why two systems cannot come together and then you create if you change one thing you change everything uh, so these, these are the kind of things that stimulate you to think yeah how can I learn new things to adapt and apply mm -hmm. so lifelong learning and always look for things that can be applied uh, and not necessarily solving problem but sometimes just for your fun your enjoyment so don't just always work 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 but also enjoy. And then learning is a joyful process. So I would say always invest yourself and discover the joy of learning. I think these are important things for us to move on. And that's the reason why I always enjoy, I'm the CEO of the Science Center. That's the place that we play with learning. We encourage people to play and learn. And uh, we are in still of learning. We are also in still of learners. Yeah. yeah, thank you. How about uh, Kiwi? Do you have anything to add? on your own experience. So you, <laughs> you did not uh, like, uh, start it as a like, hardware marker, but now you uh, I, I think, I think uh, 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 Dr. Lim has mentioned uh, most of what is like uh, having the curiosity to, to learn. Uh, I think the only thing I can probably uh, add, I will just come from the anger, is that uh, in this era of um, technology changes, but open source has been so established, right? most of the disruptive technology all come from open source. So rather than seeing technology as a threat to your current job or expertise, you should embrace it and then use it, since it's open source, right? Use it, enhance yourself, and then compete again. Um, so that kind of self-improvement uh, mindset, rather than a very protectionism, uh, like, oh, I want to protect my job because AI is going to take over my job. I think why do you think that, why don't you make use of AI to create like, more product and more jobs for yourself? Yeah, and so can you also like give some advice for the younger uh, generation um, how like to get started out in tech as a career? Uh, I think that, uh, I, I mean, this is just coming from an entrepreneur uh, standpoint is that if let's say you rather go on on a hire, hiring, uh, I need someone that can be very adaptive innovative and willing to really look out for problem to solve mm -hmm. uh, than someone who just waiting around taking instructions. Uh, I think we are right now in a new era uh, when things are just been changing nonstop. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's geopolitics, whether it's climate change, whether it's uh, economic change, so on and so forth. Uh, I think the young generation will find themselves needed to adapt to changes and to deal with a very uncertain world. So those who can do that, uh, will survive. Yes. So um, thank you very much. So we're talking about how the um, young generation can get into tech, but I also uh, want to understand the people who are already in tech. So what helped them to get more advanced in their career? 
So what are the opportunities? And of course, I, I know that there are many developers here in the room. How can you create the joy in your work? And uh, Dr. Chitmang said that, okay, if you find joy in education, find joy in the, the work that you do, you can advance much better, right? So the question is, what are the required skills in order to advance um, uh, your career in tech? And um, what keep people motivated? Uh, sure. oh, well, speaking by experience, uh, you just have to love what you do, right? Like, I came from sales. I was there for eight years, right? And I got sick of having Coda. <laughs> Sorry, sorry for any sales people here. I got sick of having Coda. I was thinking, I want to try something else. You know, I want to change my lifestyle. I want to have, you know, I want to do something, try something else. Uh, tried marketing, never looked back, right? So you have to love what you do. Um, and I stuck on startups because I like the, the hands-on part. Some people cannot do that. That's fine, too. Like, it's, it, it is what it is, right? Uh, as long as you're comfortable with what you do, you're happy. I think that's, uh, and then the advance, the career will always follow you around because when you're happy, you're productive and you keep on learning because you want to learn. Mm -hmm. But if you're not happy, then that's, that, that's when you get stagnant and that's when you sort of like lose productivity. Yeah. So Cheryl, just a curious question. So um, you don't have quota in, uh, in marketing, but what is the KPIs? So, for well, instance, if you come what here... What we do, we help the salespeople <laughs> create a pipeline. So we call it marketing source pipe, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we do have a quota, but it's not as detrimental, I guess. Mm -hmm. if, you don't, like, if you don't meet your quota, your mm -hmm. boss will kill you, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? But we do have it, obviously. We, everyone has KPIs, right? Yeah. So for marketing, it's a marketing source pipe. We have to help the salespeople create the pipeline. Oh, okay. Yeah. And Foss Asia, like events like this obviously help to create adoption and then ultimately some of these people will but hopefully buy your product at some point. Yeah. Just just a bit on the keyword there. You kept she kept saying create, create, create. I think uh, uh, in a tech field if you can create value for your company, for whatever agency you're working for, I think that is a very good indicator that you can progress more. And the creating bit, uh, one thing I like to encourage people is that is you should create with a community. You do not create all by yourself. Because once you come together, one plus one is greater than two. And therefore, again, coming to advise the young people, you must be able to work with a team of people as much as possible because the combined strength is much more. I was just this morning at Meta. So I asked the people how they work. They actually form teams. Mm -hmm. And when they find that they need to solve a client's requirement, they're bringing expertise to kind of make the team and so on and so forth. So I think this co-creation bit to create value is how you can progress. Yeah, create value. Habasino, do you have something to add here? Yeah, uh, I would say be a, a team player who demonstrates results. I know it sounds very, very corporate, uh, but when you get down to what it really means, it simply means show results. You have to show the impact of whatever you're doing. The, the results have to speak for themselves. And that's what eventually then lets you grow because people see what you're capable of. Uh, and that's what then gives you more opportunities to, to take up. Yes. Uh, I totally agree, and I don't think being a good team player only applies for corporates. I think in the open source community, we also need very good teamwork in order to, to success. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Kiwi, do you want to, to jump in? Uh, no, <laughs> okay, good. So, um, uh, how are we with the time? Um, um, so, I, I, I think that it's time now um, to open up the floor. Uh, to the audience. So um, let's see if we have any if we have any audience um, question from the audience. So everyone uh, very successful now with their career. They all have very good job. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can ask a question. You are more than welcome. Um, so. Um, I'm going to go a bit uh, towards the hiring part of, of finding a job. Um, we see these big companies, uh, especially the big ones, Microsoft, Google, Amazon maybe. Uh, they do this uh, very focused data structures and algorithm 
for software engineers, right? They do these very focused data structures and, and algorithm uh, interviews uh, where you have to like type or, or write on a whiteboard and all that, right? And this has been very um, um, controversial in, 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 in some uh, tech communities. Like, uh, are we assessing correctly students? Uh, are we assessing correctly candidates? Uh, or are we just uh, kicking them out because they couldn't uh, find uh, the, how many windows are in New York, right? Um, so, um, given this, I think there's, there's a very good option on, on looking at a candidate's profile if it's an open source contributor, because you can see what he does. But um, I, I want to know what's the, the, the panel view on, on this process, can, how can it can be improved? And, and if candidates, because not everyone has the luxury to be able to work their daily life on open source. So what would be your, that's, sec, that's, that's the second question, what would be your advice for the people that are not 100% in open source to, to somehow showcase their value um, through, through their work? Um, so I'd like to answer that uh, and to the two questions. So the first is, the, the the primary thing that these companies are testing for is your problem solving skills. So what they're trying to do, I mean, some tests, yes, may be more difficult or the questions may be slightly harder, uh, but they are constantly also revising all of that. But one main thing that they test for is problem solving. And how are you able to break down a problem where you may not have all the information? So sometimes, and this happens all the time in your day-to-day -day work, where we do not have all of the answers, we don't have all the resources, but you still have to go solve. So it just, they're trying to see what would you do if you lived in all of these constraints and how would you think and approach? So that's what they test for. And if they're able to see that you have a clear way of trying to approach a problem, that's what they want. Uh, the second, which is, if you haven't really done any open source projects or if you're completely new to this, the one way that uh, uh, that people should go about this would, would also be to just self-learn. Um, it's These days, it's a lot easier for you to do, let's say, to go after some online training, to consume content, uh, to take up a certification, uh, and I know that people who have not been, who are not technical, and I'm not very technical, I can't claim I am, but it is easy to go take up certifications if you have the interest or inclination. So the, the first step would be, yes, go take some of those content or consume some of that, uh, because then you're able to sort of get to a point where then you can meet some more like-minded people and you know, try to get some, some foot in the door in terms of doing projects, et cetera. Um, the other thing, uh, and I think there was a person called Annie this morning who talked about something called the Code Without Barriers. Um, this is a program which we initially started through Microsoft and with a lot of partnering companies for um, to build women uh, diversity in the tech industry uh, and to upskill them. So the idea was we came up with, uh, all of these companies came together to say, how do we upskill women um, and then give them a platform because they may not know where to start. Mm -hmm. So this program, the Code Without Barriers, uh, we give them a way to, to upskill, which is take, consume some of that content, take up the certifications, and then to, to remote, I mean, to apply it, we give them the, uh, give them the opportunities to participate in hackathons so then they are able to use some of these skills in for, to apply it for real life problems and solve it. So we invite them to be part of hackathons. And then we also give them mentoring. So I'm also, my evening job or my non-day job is also the, the mentoring and pillar lead for Code Without Barriers. So I look at pulling together mentors and mentees. So mentors who've been in the tech industries and then mentees who, you know, who probably are starting off or our career shifters as well, uh, try to get them together and then to see how they can get, get more d guidance in that direction. So getting a mentor again is a great way if you don't know where to start. Um, and that's probably the journey towards getting landing an internship or eventually landing a job. Thank you, Sinhu, for very insightful answer. Are you happy with the answer, Marco? 
<laughs> okay, thank you. Unfortunately, um, that is all the time we have for today. Um, I would like to once again thank you very much, our panelists, for being here today. And thank you to all for, for joining us. Enjoy the rest of uh, your day at the Post Asia Summit. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>